Well, nobody from the choir went sprinting to their seats, but I won't hold it against you. You've got your Bible this morning. Turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. This morning we're going to be reading three verses from the fourth chapter of that Gospel. Matthew 4, verses 8 through 10. And don't necessarily need to turn there for the one verse, but if you'll listen as well, I'll also read from Mark chapter 8, verse 36, which you've heard me say as a kid already this morning. Follow along then from Matthew's Gospel, starting in chapter 4, verse 8. I'll read to verse 10, and I'll read for you Mark 8, 36. Matthew 4, 8 says that again... The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And Mark 8 36, Jesus asked the question, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world but lose his soul? Let's pray over what we've read and what you've heard. Lord, we thank you for this look from Scripture at a temptation each of us faces. The temptation to give up so much to acquire what seems like so much. God, I pray that this message would help to speak to these words of scripture. And I pray, Lord, that we would leave this church building seeking to better serve you as the church. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. Winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. He might not have been the first person to say those words, but Vince Lombardi is the one who made them famous. Winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. That, that quote is most often attributed to him probably because his life so embodied it. Vince Lombardi was a winner. As coach of the Green Bay Packers in the 1960s, he won the NFL championship six times, including the first two Super Bowls. Twice he was the NFL's coach of the year. Over the course of his entire career, he won almost three quarters of the games that he coached, including nine out of 10 in the playoffs. By the time that he retired, Vince Lombardi was a shoe-in for the NFL Hall of Fame. And not only that, if you were to make a Mount Rushmore of football coaching, his face would most certainly be on that mountain. He is so associated with winning that the Super Bowl trophy now bears his name. Everything about Vince Lombardi makes you think of winning. So it's no wonder that he said what he did. Winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. When you hear those words, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing, more and more, it does kind of seem that way, doesn't it? More and more, in so many aspects of life, it does seem like winning isn't everything. Winning is all that matters. You see it in, in sports, Lombardi's field, whether at the national level or the collegiate level or even the high school level, that winning is not only an objective, winning is not only the highest objective, that winning is the only objective. It is all that really matters. See in sports, you see it in business, where a promotion is all that matters, where profits are all that matter, where everything else is to be set to the side in the pursuit of victory. You see it in 
politics, you see it in family dynamics, you see it, yes, even in ministry. Getting the win is what matters most. Getting a victory is what must go at the top, and everything else we throw overboard for the sake of winning. Winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. That's what Vince Lombardi said. <laughs> so our question this morning is what does Jesus say? We live in a world that more and more seems to be listening to Vince Lombardi. Who will the kingdom of God listen to? Our passage that we've read from this morning, from Matthew's Gospel, comes from the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Before we can look forward, we must look back to the beginning of his ministry. The very beginning, we tend to say, was not in a palace, was not in the temple, it was in the Jordan River. That was where the ministry of Jesus truly began when his cousin John immersed him in the waters, and when Jesus came up from the depths of that river, heard that voice saying, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. It was from that moment that Jesus, about 30 years old, began his ministry. You might think that from that point he would have gone straight to Jerusalem, straight to the holy city to take on the chief priests and to take on the teachers of the law, to show them what the kingdom of God was really all about. But he didn't go to Jerusalem first. Instead, he took a hard left turn to the wilderness, where for 40 days he fasted and he prayed. It's a time of spiritual preparation for Jesus. Fasting and praying for 40 days and the preparation did not stop there, because we are told in the Gospels that during that time, Jesus was tempted. Tempted by Satan, by the accuser, the very devil himself, who came to see if he could throw Jesus, at the very beginning of his ministry, off track. <coughs> to see if he could push him away from the mission to which the Father had given him. So though we haven't read it, you may be familiar with the first two of the temptations that Matthew lists. We don't know everything that was said between Satan and Jesus, but Matthew gives us the cliff notes. The first temptation, we're told, was the devil saying to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to turn to bread. You've gone without food for 40 days. You've gone without water for 40 days. You're hungry. Well... If you're so hungry, end your fast. Use the power God's given you and feed yourself, Jesus. Take care of yourself. Jesus responds to him with scripture, telling him that the devil's not the one who's going to end this fast. So the devil tries a different tactic. Takes Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple, to the very heights themselves, looking down over the holy city, and says, if you are the son of God, then let's put on a show. Throw yourself off this pinnacle. And in doing so, you and I both know the Father's not going to let anything happen to you. He'll send his angels to rescue you. Nothing's going to happen, but everyone will know who you are. They'll see what it is God sent you to do. So go ahead, Jesus. Put on a show. Throw yourself off the temple so that God might save you in front of everyone. Yet again, Jesus tells the devil, I will not put the Lord to the test, responds to him with scripture, and refuses the temptation. It's after these two that we're brought to this third temptation that we've read together. And I noticed something when I read it. This time Satan takes a slightly different tack in the way that he says it. He does not begin the temptation this time with, if you are the son of God. Those first temptations you might have noticed, they're pretty specific to Jesus. If Satan were to come to me this morning and tempt me to turn those rocks outside to bread, it wouldn't be much of a temptation for me. It's not something I particularly have to worry about, seeing as how I don't have those sorts of miraculous powers. 
If Satan were to come to one of you and say, climb up to the top of Shiloh Baptist Church and throw yourself off the roof, don't worry, the angels will rescue you, you probably would not be as tempted. Those are specific sorts of temptations for the Son of God himself. But this third one, this third one, he doesn't begin by saying, if you are the Son of God. And I suspect that's become, because this is a temptation that is common to all men and all women. This one tempts all of us. The devil shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth, Matthew says, and tells Jesus, I will give you power, I will give you fame, I will give you riches. Everything you can see is yours. If you'll fall down and worship me. Satan saved the best temptation for last, if you ask me. Because we are all hardwired to want more than what God gives us. We all want more than what God gives us. So in Jesus' case here, Satan offers Jesus what looks like more than what God is willing to give. God has a mission for Jesus. His mission is to proclaim the kingdom of God. To proclaim it with words in his teachings. To proclaim it with his life. With the way that he conducts himself. To proclaim it with miracles. And ultimately to proclaim the kingdom of God by ushering it in with his death on the cross. And his resurrection from the grave. That's the mission of Jesus. To tell and show the world that the kingdom of God has come. And as I said, it's a mission that ends with suffering and death and resurrection. It's a hard road that Jesus is called to. So what does Satan say here? What if I made it easier for you to become king? God's way ends with you as king of kings and lord of lords. But what if I could give you that right now? Without the suffering. Without the scorn. Without the cross. What if I just made you king right now? What if I gave you your crown right here in this moment? Wouldn't that be easier, Jesus? Don't you want more than what God is offering you? God wants you to be a suffering servant. God wants you to be a man of sorrows. God wants you to be a crucified Christ. Don't you want more than that? I'll tell you, I suspect that in some part of his mind, the answer may have been yes. That's why we call it a temptation. Whether Jesus gave into it or not, that's why we call it a temptation. And in that regard, Jesus was fully human. Because we all want more than what God gives us. We all want more than what God gives us. A story about a boy who, Willy Wonka style, was awarded a tour of a chocolate factory. When he got there, this Willy Wonka figure took him to the gift shop first. Usually you end a tour with the gift shop, but he did things differently. Starts in the gift shop and says, you can have any piece of candy you want in this entire shop. Or, you can take anything along the way as we go about our tour. You only get one thing, but you can pick it here from the gift shop, or you can get something along the way. Boy goes in the gift shop, he's overwhelmed by everything he sees. All the chocolate, all of uh, the fruity candy, all of the high fructose corn syrup. It's everywhere. It's all over the place. And he sees his very favorite candy. And it's a king size. I mean, it's the, it's the biggest he's ever seen. It's bigger than a king size. He's never seen anything like this at Bucky's. This is the real deal. <laughs> and he admires this thing. And the man in charge of the chocolate factory says, you can, you can have this, or you can wait and see what you see on the tour. The boy thinks about it and says, I've never seen anything that big. <clears throat> but it's a chocolate factory. I'll probably see something better on my tour. They begin the tour. 
They go to the first room. And there's a lot to see. A lot of great chocolate being made. But it's all your fun size variety. So they keep going. Go to the next room. There's some good chocolate being made. You got your dark chocolate, got your white chocolate, got your milk chocolate. But it's all about the size of what you'd find at HEB. Goes to the third and final room, and this time the boy's sure he's gonna be able to get something really, really good. Nothing compares to what he saw in the gift shop. Tells the owner of the chocolate factory at the end of the tour, well, can we can we go can we go back to the to the gift shop? The best thing I could have gotten was there at the very beginning. And he says, No, I'm afraid not. Could have had it when I gave it to you, but you decided that you needed more. I think a lot of us resemble that boy. Because we are all blessed in one way or another with abundance. May not be material abundance, may not be wealth, but we are all in some way blessed with an abundance. But we always want more. In our world, you see, it blesses that mentality. Our world blesses the attitude that you should always want more. Our world says always keep striving. Always keep reaching for more. Always be hungry for more than what you have. In the eyes of the world, there is no greater sin than satisfaction. The thing is, God created you in his image. God sent his son to die for you. It's amazing that we think that more power or more fame or more wealth can get us more than what God has already given. Go back to the story for a second. In this story, Satan offers this tremendous temptation, more. Jesus, I'll give you more than what God is offering. I'll give you everything, in fact. Everything you could ever want. But if you read to the end of the verse, you, you may have noticed something. It comes with a cost. Look again at verse 9. He said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. That day in the wilderness, Jesus was offered the ultimate victory, the ultimate win. But it came with the ultimate price. To gain the whole world would cost Jesus his soul. You get a really good picture of that from J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. The character of Smeagol. In particular, you may know him better as Gollum if you've read the books or seen the movies. This figure who, through a series of circumstances, comes upon the one ring of power. This item, this piece of jewelry that makes the wielder more powerful than they ever could have imagined. Gives them the ability to hide in plain sight, extends their life makes them more powerful than they ever could have dreamed of being. And Smeagol gets a hold of this ring and finds that it draws him in. Starts to become different from who he used to be, no longer carefree. Now he clings to this thing so tightly that it begins to change him. He slowly, over years, begins to wither away from the inside. All because he cannot bear to part with what he has started to call his precious. This more that he got his hands on ultimately steals his soul. Ruins him from the inside out. Either one of these stories. Jesus in the wilderness. Fictional story of Gollum from the Lord of the Rings. Either one of these stories, they're very vivid, aren't they? 
this idea of reaching for more, stealing your soul. This Faustian bargain of trading your soul to the devil for whatever it is you want. It's a vivid picture. But it almost doesn't seem believable when you put it that way. Trading your soul for something you want. Because chances are, you're not going to be tempted in the wilderness the way Jesus was. You're not going to see Satan physically before you offering you a deal like this. You're not going to physically wither away from the inside out like Gollum did. <laughs> Temptation doesn't usually work that way. It's not usually happening all at once. Temptation tends to come in drips and drafts. Temptation tends to just cut a little corner of your soul here and there. But make no mistake, every time you cut a corner to get a win, you trade just a little bit of your soul. Every time you say, well, you got to do what you got to do to get ahead, you trade a little something away at yourself. Every time that you say the end justifies the means, you trade a little something away. Because being a winner in the eyes of the world, being the winner in the eyes of the world, it often comes at a cost. And if you take nothing else, from this story from Matthew 4. Then hear this. The cost isn't worth it. The price you must pay to get the almighty win, trading your soul to gain the whole world, it's a bad deal. It's a poor bargain. In the temptation story from Matthew 4, Jesus rejects Satan's offer out of hand. Away with me, Satan, he says. Pushes him out of the picture. And God takes care of him from there on out. I wonder if it was with this event in mind that he said what he did in Mark chapter 8. I wonder if he thought back to that day in the wilderness when he rhetorically asked the disciples, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Trading away your soul for the sake of winning, ultimately it reveals itself to be a bad deal. Because the winds are fleeting and the costs are not. In David Lodge's novel, Therapy, we see this when one of the main characters at the advice of his therapist is told to make two lists. Get a sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle, make two lists. On the one, he's told to think about his life and to list all of the good things in his life in one column. And on the other column, to list all the bad things. In the left column, where the good things go. He writes down professionally successful, well off, good health, stable marriage, kids successfully launched into adult life, nice house, great car, as many holidays as I want. In the other column, where the bad things go, he only has one item. <clears throat> Feel unhappy most of the time. According to the narrative of our world, those two columns can't belong next to one another. If you have everything in the first column, how could you ever write what's in the second? You have everything you could ever need, everything you could ever want. You have gained the whole world character in that novel realizes that the cost was not worth what it took to get all of that. 
Our world, our culture, says that we should want to be a winner, whatever the cost. To do what it takes to succeed. <clears throat> Truth is, when it costs your soul to gain the whole world, the reward is not worth it. I started the message this morning with that quote from Vince Lombardi that winning isn't everything it's the only thing as I close I want to give you a second quote of his from later in life years down the road after his football career had ended he was asked about what he'd said about winning being the only thing he was asked about it and he replied I wish I'd never said the thing I meant the effort. I meant having a goal. I sure didn't mean for people to crush human values and morality. The man who gave us the maxim withdrew it when he saw what it had become. So if winning isn't the only thing, if winning's not the only thing that matters, what is? The world tells us that getting the victory is what matters most. What is the alternative? A lawyer asked Jesus that question in Matthew 22. Let me read how that dialogue went. The lawyer asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment of God in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. Love God and love people, Jesus says. Everything hangs on these two. Love God and love people. This is the only thing. The world says to be successful, to be a winner, you have to have. You have to compile. Jesus says you have to give. The world says that to be a winner, you have to be willing to cut through people. Jesus says you have to be willing to love people. The world says you have to be so single-minded on your goals that nothing else matters. Jesus says to be so single-minded in the pursuit of God that nothing else matters. The world demands winners, but God shows us a different path. To victory. 1 John 5 14, 5 4, pardon me. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world our faith. The world says that you need to be a winner, but the kingdom of God doesn't really need more winners. It is finished, the battle's already won. The kingdom of God doesn't need more winners. The kingdom needs more disciples.